When you think about the entrepreneurial spirit, which you just mentioned, what does that mean to you? I think that number one is probably being able to solve problems. Even more than that is being willing to solve a problem. As soon as you yeah. said that, I was like, it's willing. It's you the have willing. To be willing to solve a problem. You have to recognize that this might not be easy, but if I put my mind to it, I can solve it. Every entrepreneur will tell you that it's the stick to itiveness that makes the difference. You can't give up. We've done that. Uh, we learned that like probably every entrepreneur out there around it. We can all call it the hard way. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. It's your host, as always, Jason Skisik, the entrepreneurial evangelist. And I'm here today with Steve Pirick. Steve, how are you, man? I'm doing great today. How are you doing, Jason? I'm good, man. I'm so glad we got to have this conversation for a number of reasons, but not the least of which we struggled to kind of make the connections yes. work. And even yeah. today, I was on daddy duty and you were so <laughs> gracious and flexible. So I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, no problem. Plenty of things to do in the meantime. So. Yeah, plenty, I'm sure. <laughs> um, so uh, so for starters, Steve, why don't you let people know who you are, what you do? So, um, yeah, so Steve Purick and we are... Uh, we own a business in Southeast of Michigan that's called Industrial Technology Services, as Jason said. And um, our, our niche is uh, industrial contracting for tier one, tier two suppliers, typically. Uh, a lot of automotive work because it's um, in Southeast Michigan and that's uh, just where automotive work happens uh, a lot. And um, what we do is we uh, facilitate manufacturing plants. So we do all the infrastructure work to uh, make ready a factory to make parts for automobiles. So hmm. our customer base is, uh, our niche customer is typically a tier one or tier two supplier to the automotive. They make parts uh, for automotive, or it could be housewares, it could be um, yeah. um any other kind of uh, manufacturing business. We do a lot of work in plastics. Uh, so housewares, uh, sometimes building products, those kinds of things. So a lot of customers based in Southeast Michigan, but that also uh, brings us across the country. So we do a lot of work in the country in other places um, because they have satellite facilities around the country and they supply other maybe automotive plants or other factories oems uh, yeah. in other areas of the country even just as you're talking it just occurred to me that when i worked in banking they would be like we need to we need to add another line so we need a a, 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 a you know a bridge loan for x y and z to, to yes. create this new revenue you're the guy that they call it sounds like that, to me that's right oh Somebody that's so great the nuts and bolts together so yeah that's so <laughs> great and so uh do you find that you guys are doing a lot of the same stuff or do you have to be like really adaptable to, to the job as it comes up? It's really extremely broad, Jason. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we would, uh, my old boss taught me this uh, once when I spent a little bit of time in, in uh, construction in my career, just a short period before we started our business where I learned a whole lot, but he would say, you know what, we'll, we'll wash your walls with a natural sponge if that's what you want us to do. Yeah. And we'll figure out how to do that um, if that's what's needed. Um, so our really how we how we structure the business is I came from that world. I came from um, being a part of a big manufacturing company, had multiple plants across the country, and I was responsible for new facilities in North America. So it took me a lot of different places and got to see a whole lot of things and learn a whole lot. Very good place to learn, uh, really cherish that time for that and um there's there's a million different needs for somebody in that position and the pressure from the oem from their customer is immense so um, having understood that a little bit and having lived it for a long time we started a business to kind of fill that need try and try and be a, a solution for uh, those people that are trying to put a facility together under a, a very strict budget a very strict timeline and uh, usually most of both of those are very unreasonable also. And we come up with solutions that will help them meet those deadlines, but also meet that budget, um, which takes us to 
a whole array of, of different uh, tasks, I guess you would say. So, you know, it's electrical, it's mechanical, it's process systems, it's uh, being creative about how to um, maybe introduce materials and, and uh, or uh, equipment in at a certain time or on a certain schedule so that we can meet their need, but maybe not maybe not entirely complete the project because there's just not enough time to do that, but we can actually figure out a way to thread a needle and get them the parts that they need off of their new machines uh, by their deadline. And uh, those kinds of things, those creative ways of coming up with solutions is how we really build a reputation in a business. So. Yeah. And the, I guess the immediate question I have then is, are you an unbelievable problem solver in life? Well, well I don't know about that. <laughs> Because it sounds like it. you're solving pretty unbelievable problems yeah. in business. So for, yeah. for many people, they, they seem very unbelievable. We have a great team of people here. Oh, that's so cool. Um, good, good. Uh, uh, you know, we've built it over the years and we have people that um, are seasoned. Uh, they've had a lot, a lot of experiences and we're able to share that, that experience with, with clients to come up with these solutions. But we, um, it's interesting when you watch the team get together and uh, problem solve one you know one project manager we have project managers that that go out and uh, service these customers one project manager might have a problem that it's not necessarily their expertise and when you watch everybody kind of jump in on coming up with a solution and you see this this problem evolve and become solved at a at a table at a conference table and we actually have a solution that's just not, it's not even, uh, it's not even gonna solve just their problem, but it's gonna be so much better for them that they didn't even expect. It's just great to watch and see happen and mm -hmm. when that unfolds. And it, you know, it, it, it probably looks like it's a um, great problem solving, but when you do it every day, you get better at it. So. Yeah, so that brings me to the next question. Uh, and so before, actually, before I ask that question, I wanna point something out. And something we kind of touched on before the call is when you go on to podcasts uh, or when you listen to a podcast or especially entrepreneurship podcasts, I think a lot of times you're hearing the voices of, you know, people that are seeking public uh, status or sequel, people that are selling something or people that are in marketing or any of these kind of like really flashy types of sure. positions. Yeah. And that's why I actually think yours is the is one of the most interesting uh, points of view that I'm going to get on this show, because yeah. you're out there making the trains run on time, making these things happen, you're solving problems, and typically not seeking, you know, any kind of public yeah. voice, which is why I think it's so special that you and I are having this conversation. Um, so that leads me to this question. Uh, so in business, the folks that I typically work with struggle to... Um, figure out SOPs and like repeatable processes. Sure. This is obviously yeah. not your, your yeah. weakness, right? What I guess I'm curious about is as you solve these problems over and over and again on these big scales, do you have like a library of like component parts of SOPs that you can kind of put together in a hurry? Well, yes. The answer to that is yes. And, it's, and even though there's a big broad range of different uh, tasks that we do and everyone can, you know, have a little nuance to it to make them different. And unique uh, and there's a lot of work in putting together the just the proposal to propose an idea and a solution mm -hmm. to somebody um, because they are unique one to another there are a lot of standard operating procedures when it comes to it so we've we've bumped along over 22 years we've bumped along enough to have learned some lessons um, and you know seen some roadblocks that we can avoid not just for us, it's for our, it's for our clients, our customers. If we can, if we can make their project more smooth mm -hmm. and um, and get those trains to run on time, which is the product that they asked us to deliver. If we deliver that product, really, we're just looking for that next phone call for them to come back and say, you know what, you did a great job for us last time. We really, we'd love to work with you again. So. When it comes to, like you were saying, the advertisement and everything else, we're just we're advertising the one individual, one 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 at a time, you know, yeah. all the every job, every project. And maybe and, maybe maybe let's look at that a little bit, um, sure. you know, because I think a lot of times people people try to be everything for everybody. It sounds to me like you're trying to be everything for one person, and and I'd love to hear more. You talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So yeah, every every project is unique, and they're all um, 
you know, the, the one, one person can be handling a project, you know, five projects uh, as an example at a time, maybe multiple different customers, sometimes, you know, five or 10 projects in one facility. And they're, you know, they can range from a, you know, a very small project, a couple thousand dollar project to very large, you know, you know, half a million, million dollar projects. You know, those are multifaceted, very complicated projects. Um, and you end up truly, if you want to be successful at it in our world, in our model anyway, you end up truly becoming an extension of their team. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just words. It's, it's, you really got to live it. And when you become an extension of their team, you're living that, um, that battle with them every day. And that's, what's going to lead to success. And, this, you know, the success is when you're, when you're, uh, when you're, when you're ready for them, when you're always going to be on call and when they have a, when they, when they're picking up the phone, my clients, they're up and on the job at six o'clock in the morning. That's, that's what they're doing. They're grinding it out because they're, they're having to deliver product. They've got equipment to get up and going. There's always, you know, you throw a project at a manufacturer. Usually that's not what they do every day. That's this anomaly that has to be, you know, figured out and solved so that they can do in the next five years, you know, of just repetitive manufacturing. That's their job. This is, this is something that's in the way right now. They need it for their future. So if we can be an extension of that team and solve that problem and take some of those headaches away from them, now you're really, um, there's a synergy that's just amazing. And, and I think that, I think that, you know, each project being different, you're, you're finding ways to solve these projects. What, you know, we do is we, 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 we be the solution in the beginning. These are our values this would be the solution. Get after it because they, they want nothing more than for you to be out of the way so that they can go make product and do their job. Right. Yeah. And that everybody's a winner when we're in and out and then meet the commitment, which is, you know, we're, we're going to do what we said we were going to do and deliver that product. Like we, like we said it would uh, be in, in the beginning the same kind of quality that they expect. And now we've got a success and that success is going to translate to an opportunity in our future. And, and we're already an extension of that one person's, that one individual's uh, team. So yeah, we are, we're catering to an audience of one most of the time. Yeah. And, um, and that transcends into, you know, opportunities and other plants and other companies and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, it's interesting because I think, um, I don't know what people will think about this when they hear it, like, because you're talking about some technical stuff, but what I hear is I hear you're the special forces of this thing because let me let me just let me just compare and contrast real quick. Sure. Special forces people think of like these fighters, but really they call themselves operators. And the reason they call themselves operators is because they're tasked in a small team with learning how to not just go in and destroy things, but to go into foreign governments to help train uh, their team to 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 effectively you know stand up a fighting force. They're trained to you know su get supply taken care of and create all solve all of these problems sure. in incredibly challenging circumstances and i think there's something really sexy about that the only difference between what they're doing and what you're doing is that they carry guns as far as i can That's, tell yeah that, yeah it's probably a little bit more important on their end too i think you're pretty <laughs> badass dude <laughs> <laughs> but i and i appreciate that but you know it's a it's a great analogy and i think that uh, for most of my team and we have like i said we have a really good group uh, of people and you know you've got Project managers who are on the front line, they're, they're, they're out there dealing with the, the circumstance uh, and the immediate need, you know, trying to solve the problem for, for this individual who's got, you know, they've got a hundred headaches going on in that world. I, that's where I came from. It's a very mm -hmm. high pressure, pressure cooker environment. They've got a hundred problems going on and, you know, we're just trying to sit, take two or three of them off of their plate completely so they don't have to think about it. And sometimes they're the complicated ones. Maybe that, you know, regardless, there's two or three problems off their plate if we can do that. And we've got an ops group that knows how to react. And if everybody's doing their job and everybody's working uh, uh, closely through the system, then yeah, it's it seems like we're jumping into a battle 
and we've got to get this battle done and get out. We are called all the time at very last minute. We were at the very last minute and they say, we, we need to get this done. And I've got till Monday to be up and running and we got to change this over. And it just got thrown on us. You know, they'll, yeah. they'll start with an apology, you know, and it just got thrown on us and we, we've got to get this done. If we don't get it done, we're going to be in big trouble. And so we, everybody gathers together and we assemble a team, put a team together that, you know, we've got 20 years of experience behind us with guys that have been with us for a long time and, and really kind of know the ropes and um, yeah, they, they put together uh, uh, this, these are the guys I need for this, this job because they're all different and you need a certain skill set. Uh, so you have to pick the right skill sets and um, we're going to go out of town for four days and uh, everybody's jumping in the truck tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. Yep. And tools will be on site. The whole operation starts doing their job. And by Monday morning, we, we're going to hit that green button and make sure everything runs. Oh, come on. That's great. That's so cool. It it's really, it's really cool when some of those things happen. And I'll, and I'll tell you, we'll do projects that will be huge systems, huge uh, processing systems that, you know, um, uh, uh, tower systems and chiller systems, pumping water all through a factory, you know, could be a mile of pipe and, uh, you know, a couple thousand fittings that have to be put together. And that's what we do. It doesn't sound that sexy, but you know, when you get, somebody has got to put the nuts and bolts together and you got to make sure the water stays in the pipe and not outside the pipe, you know, and, and uh, they, they can't have leaks. I'll get a call every once in a while when we're doing one of these big projects. And uh, that one moment where they, they, I say, you're going to hit this green button. And that's the, that's the start button on the system. Yeah. You're saying to everybody, this is done. We're all set. It's, we're going to hit this button and everything's going to be okay. And it's just nervous, anxious <laughs> yeah. tension because when you hit yeah. that button, you, you hope everything holds together because yeah. <laughs> you're going to pump thousands of gallons of water at a you know very high velocity <laughs> into these pipes that's all over strewn all over somebody's yeah. factory yeah it could i mean this is this is the moment of disaster or the moment of you know success and um i'll get a call you know 45 minutes an hour later and uh yeah we started up the system and some of the guys will tell me exactly how many feet of pipe are up there and how many fittings and they'll say no leaks oh that's great <laughs> have you ever had one go bad Oh yeah. When, when oh, we hit yeah. the button. Yeah, we've had our, we've had plenty of plenty of bumps along the way. So we've learned a lot and we've learned sometimes the hard way and, and sometimes we figure out how to work, you know, learn the simple way. But uh yeah, no no question. Uh, problems will happen. And um uh, and that and that's just a that's just a part of it. Working with a lot of uh companies and different uh clients and you know, everybody's everybody's got a different view of problems, but for us we, you know. We try to minimize them because you know nobody needs problems. That, that problems just just cause everybody headaches and mm -hmm. money and everything else. Time, everything goes upside down. So, of course, we're always trying to to uh, solve those before they happen. But when they do happen, um, we react. It's just a matter of reacting. And now you're dealing with this this problem, the leaks or whatever it might be, and you deal with it. Deal with it quickly and. You be ready for it. We don't hit the green button unless we got a crew ready. So yeah. um, those kinds of things. And, you know, that's just one example of one type of, of work that we do. And um, it is fun. So it's, um, yeah, it's like, it's like uh, putting a mission together. It really is. No, I couldn't agree more. I mean, even just just to kind of widen the gap a little bit here, you know, early on, I mentioned, you know, the special forces, but also, and again, not to blow smoke up your ass here, Steve, but like, this is what NASA does. They like have to push a button and that rocket has to go That's off. Right. And sometimes it works. Tense. This is what surgeons do when they plan a big surgery yeah. with multiple yeah. different hands in the pot. They write books about these tribal groups of people that do very challenging tasks together with very high stakes. Yeah. I think it's, um, I think it's fascinating that we don't, um, that we don't celebrate 
people in the fields like you are as much as we should because i think that it, during world war ii who was the rock stars it was the oh, no. it, that's it, right they were it, bringing it, the planes off the line and building yep. you know tanks and those are great stories i know? mean the industrial revolution was led by people who did what you're talking about yes. um yes. And so tell me a little bit about the connection that you have or that you, your team has. The folks that are doing this together, um, what are they like and, and what are their relationships like? You know, we're very fortunate in that we have a, a lot of good, uh, they're skilled trades, so they learn a trade. Um, they're, they're good. Uh, you know, we've built um, with uh, some people that we've had for a long time, some great relationships uh, we're trying to, you know, we're, we're 22 years old and we started with myself for like three years and just grew from there. So we, and we're a small company. We've got, we've got just under 50 people in this organization, but they all build really good, um, friendships. And I love to see that. Um, it's also interesting to watch them grow as young people. They're, they're growing and, and, um, you know, buying their first car, we see that happen and, and uh, we see them buying their first house. It's nothing better than, yeah. than that, you know, fax machine. I say fax machine because some of the banks and the lenders still use fax machines. <laughs> yeah. and, that, and that fax machine beeps and, the, and a request for, you know, employment history comes over because somebody wants to buy a house and want to get their first mortgage. And we think that's great. And, um, and then they build a family and that. So, you know, um, watching that happen with the group is wonderful to sit and watch and see that happen, but watch them build friendships and bonds between each other. is even better. Mm. And, uh, when they're on the job, you know, that, you know, there's, there can be tension. Some of these, some of these guys can be together for three weeks at a time and, uh, away and mm -hmm. also away from their family. So that's, that can be tough, but, um, you know, with, you know, outside of, uh, outside of the occasional tension that anybody would have, I grew up with, you know, four brothers and one sister. So I get that. <laughs> um, they get along really well and they know how to, how to complete the mission and how to, how to make the best out of the day. And they, they work hard at it. And I think that's really what, uh, that's the core of success mm -hmm. in a business like mine anyways, mm -hmm. is the people uh, you have to have the right kind of people. And, and, um, and appreciate them for what they're up against every day. Our, our number one, the, the number one uh, concern for everybody in the organization is the guy on the ground. We, mm -hmm. we call it the guy on the ground. Mm -hmm. You have to support that, that person that's in the field. That person in the field is responsible for everything that's going on in the company right now. And, and if they don't have the right tools, if they don't have the right uh, information, drawings, or they don't have the right materials, or they don't have the right people, everybody in the organization is to be working at trying to solve that problem. Mm -hmm. Because they're the ones that are, are really representing us on the front line. So, and uh, if we can get everybody to appreciate that and do their job, which they do, um, it's successful. It's not perfect. There's problems in all those areas, but uh, it can be it, it can be wonderful to see and watch unfold. Yeah, I can imagine. How do you uh, how do you deal with stress and how has that changed over time? Because you seem like super even. Yeah, I appreciate that. It has changed a lot over time. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I, that's a that's a great that's a great question, Jason. And I was able to say to a couple of people just recently how much of a uh, pleasure it is, but a relief, I guess, for me um, as the owner. And um, I'll get a call from somebody that um, has a, a major problem. You know, they've got a, they're up against some kind of, you know, ridiculous deadline and they don't know, they don't have a solution for it. And now they just found out from their, their customer that they have to be um, up and going, say two weeks early or something like that. And I got a problem in this plant it has to be dealt with right now. Mm -hmm. What, um, what is really, really wonderful today, as opposed to many, many years ago and starting is I can call any one of my, any one of my project managers, any one of my leaders and say, here, give this, give this person a call or go meet them. And I don't have to worry about it. 
I I know they might they might reach out and you know ask a question here or there, but they know what to do. They know that if they don't have the answer, they'll have to go get the answer. They know who to go to to get those answers, and they know that it's important for this client to get this taken care of immediately. Mm-hmm. And that's given me an immense amount of relief uh, today versus years ago. Uh, you know, I mean, just just living with hanging a shingle back then yeah. to be the that guy, which I was for a large company. You know, I was the you know the one individual that had to pull all this stuff together for plants all over the country with a team too. You know, not just sure. solely by myself, but with a, a great team of people. But having the responsibility to do it, man, that's there's a lot of anxiety, tension, and stress associated with that. And then hanging a shingle, thinking that you know it should be easy going into business, which was ridiculous to think. But um, and then and then taking on that responsibility for other people, multiple other companies. Um, yeah, there was a lot of stress associated with it in the beginning. And then figuring out a path to, to solve all those problems. Having having had the the people and and the uh, the time, I guess, and you know, for, for sure for sure time. Time, you know, you need time to build something, but having the time to build an organization that can react like we do today. Yeah, it's taken a, an immense amount of pressure off. Everybody has a little bit of pressure, but we share it well, I think. Do you think you could run the business that you run today if you hadn't done it yourself years ago? Great question. Um, well, no. No, I, I probably would have never gone into it. I would have never gone into it. So if that answers your question. Well, I guess maybe the question would be if I sent somebody, say a Harvard MBA, yeah. fresh out of school or, or, or maybe with some experience in a different field. Yeah. Um, do you believe that for the position you sit in requires the years of service and the deployments, you know, to the war zones? Mm. You know what I mean? Well, to do it the way we do it today. Yes. We yeah. certainly learned along the way. Um, but I've always been a problem solver. Um, you know, that's just my nature. That's that's what made me jump into business. Uh, finally, it was a little late in life, but um, you know, I've, I've always had the entrepreneurial spirit in me. And and uh, you have to be a problem solver. And when you, once you jump into business, you realize all the problems you have. I think. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> that you never thought you would. Um, and you got to be you, you've got to be able to to react to things and, and come up with a solution. So could I do that? Yeah, I think so. Um, but it would be, you know, obviously uh, it might be a little bit, feel a little bit outside of my element before we got it solved. You know? When you think about the entrepreneurial spirit, which you just mentioned, what does that mean to you? Uh, I think that, you know, number one is, is probably being uh, able to solve problems. Um, Probably even more than that is being willing to solve a problem. You That's really what I was thinking to, too. As soon as you yeah. said that, I was like, "It's willing. It's you the have willing." To be willing to solve a problem, you have to. Yeah. You have to recognize that um, this might not be easy, but uh, if I put my mind to it, I can. I can solve it, and uh, you know, I mean, every entrepreneur will tell you that it's the it's the stick to itiveness that makes the difference. Uh, you mm-hmm. can't give up, and uh, you know, we've we've done that. Uh, we learned that, uh, like probably every entrepreneur out there learned it. Um, you know, we can all call it the hard way. I don't know if there is an easy way. Maybe, maybe there is, but uh, we've all learned it a little bit the hard way. You, you know, you get tossed in the deep end. Uh, nobody prepares you or really can prepare you to, to go into business and become that entrepreneur. But at the same time, you know, I also want to give, you know, a lot of recognition to the people. My wife is a big part of it. I, my, uh, my family support was amazing. Uh, a lot of friendships and colleagues that I built and business relationships that uh, I had before I went into business and I have now still today are a big part of, part of it. And then certainly as we built the company and added on employees, good, good people that are, you know, I, I really think of the kind of work that we do. Most of my people are a little, have a little entrepreneur in them. You know, they, they, they have to. They have to be able to think outside the box and 
you're not, you're never doing the same thing every day twice. So, um, and I think that 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 has been very very valuable for us in, in being able to you know solve those problems, um, be willing to solve those problems, and then you know over time you have a confidence that you can solve the problem. You get a little bit more emboldened, I guess, if you will. Um, it doesn't it doesn't scare you so much. What do you look for when you're trying to build the team? What, how do you I, how do you find people? that can be integrated yeah. into this type of a system that aren't entrepreneurs themselves. Cause you're describing sure. it, your business is somewhat unique in that not just you have to be entrepreneurial, which is never giving up and finding solutions mm -hmm. to problems. But how do you find folks that are willing to do that for you uh, at the yeah. employee level? Great, great question. That's um, and today is harder than any, any other day. I think uh, mm -hmm. certainly in our, in our own history, um, it's never been more difficult uh, as far as employing people in that, Another problem that we're, you know, we're willing to try and attack and they're going through it like everybody else. But um, I think the, the number one thing um, to try and find the right people is uh, we, we have three, three criteria that I've touted for since the very beginning. I want them to be honest, hardworking, and self-motivated. Mm. And um, when I think about you know, my parents, my dad uh, was in the automotive industry as well as a supplier and, uh, you know, been around it in the Midwest, um, that Midwestern work ethic, if you will, uh, that people talk about. And I think that there's a definition to it. And I think that uh, by and large, you could probably narrow it down to honest, hardworking and self-motivated. If you can, if you can identify somebody like that, if they're a librarian and they want to be a pipe fitter, we can make them a pipe fitter or a welder or a, uh, you know, an electrician. Uh, if, if they really, if they have those three pieces, finding those three pieces in people, it's, it's, it's not an easy job. Um, it, it takes a little bit of time too, but those are the, those are the main things. What it really comes down to, I think Jason, if you sum all three of those up is just good character fine character and uh and if you have that then um you know maybe maybe the job doesn't fit everybody but somebody with good character is going to recognize that and then maybe we can help them find something that fits better for everybody yeah i agree with that you talked about the hiring environment and how it's changed what do you think has changed about the labor force about how people view incentives or their jobs uh, over the past few years, and, and what do you yeah. can you speak to that a little? Yeah, good question. Probably the answer jumps around a lot because we're we're in the middle of it. Um, you know, I think that uh, for the younger folks, uh, my experience here for the younger folks that um, um, aren't so willing to to give it the time it needs to you know start a career. Sometimes we find folks that you know uh, that they. They've decided that they, you know, decided to go to a trade school or they decided that they're not going to go to college and they want to jump into the workforce. And, you know, we're, we're always willing to take somebody on who's um, willing to do that and doesn't know anything. We'll start them from scratch and, and groom them into something that, you know, maybe they want to do for the rest of their life uh, because there's great careers in the trades. And um, when we, what we see more now is, um, there's just not a willingness to, to do that because they don't, I think a lot of them don't feel the need. I think that, you know, when we told them for years, decades, you know, half century that you really you have to get a job, you have to go to work, you have to get into a, a, a place where you can be, uh, build a, a career out of, and that security is so important. You really have to have that. And then I think they found out over the last several years it's really not that important. <laughs> yes, they did. <laughs> Almost like it was a big lie, you know. <laughs> and um, and now they, you know, they they have a they have a flexibility where I don't have to have that job today. I can I can get one tomorrow, or maybe even next year, or something like that. And uh, maybe maybe you know evaluate my options and things. I think that's a part of it. I don't I certainly don't think that that's all of it. Um, I think, I also think that, um, 
you know, we've created a, 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 a certainly in, in the industrial side, uh, the manufacturing side, we have a manufacturing business as well. In, in those areas, um, there's so much opportunity elsewhere that um, putting in that time, that longevity to build a, a career in a company that's interested like ours, we're interested in providing um, services, employee services and benefits that will help somebody long-term. We're trying, to, we're trying to create an environment for somebody to have long-term security. Mm -hmm. I don't think people care about that so much anymore. I think it's a, a if I can make a few dollars now and you know get by, uh, maybe I'll take a break for the summer and then find yeah. something else. Flexibility I, I, is in there. Yeah. So you say that they don't care about it, and I don't disagree with that. But I would say that it's not. I think it's hard to not attribute attribute. It's hard to not attribute emotion to these types of things. But you could look at this from just the market and the market when we're buying labor and selling labor. Yeah. The people selling labor are selling it for different currencies than they used to. Uh, they're, in my opinion, uh, they used to be told the American dream. And if I save up dollars or have a job that I hate but pays me a lot of money, this is a virtuous thing. Right. And it seems like. If you look at people's incentives, like the bar charts of what that consists of, whether it's flexibility and money and, you know, time and uh, benefits or whatever, it seems like the money one particularly has come down. Um, yes. And then on top of that, we have capitalism giving, like bringing the floor up. And so it's like, well, when you fall on your face, you used to starve to death. Yes. When you fall right. on your, when you fall on your face now, you yes. work for Uber or you deliver right. for, for Amazon. That's, and so there's. Right. That's what I was getting at earlier too. Yeah. I mean, it's a great example. You, you know, it's 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 really not it's really not a lifelong repercussion. It, you know, I'm good. No, in fact, <laughs> in fact, the market has actually ad adapted to where even employers incentivize hopping from lily pad to lily pad now. Oh yeah. If yeah. even at the bank where I worked, it was like, oh, the only yeah. way to make MD yeah. to make managing director was to leave and then be yes. hired back. Absolutely. And you know what? I mean, I'll I. That was part of my career. I did a lot of moving around and I, you know, I benefited from that as well and learned a lot about a lot of different organizations, which was part and parcel to giving me an opportunity to do this because, you know, I, I realized that there's this need everywhere. But you bring up a good point. You know, the lily padding going on is concerning uh, in our industry because even in our organization, we've had we've had our share of turnover, like everybody else. But um, we've had our share of turnover with some seasoned people and and some not so seasoned people. That the turnover at the lower level is a lot more prevalent, a lot quicker. All this turnover at every single level, level, you know, it won't be long before everybody in our country will be new at their job. They're all going to be fresh and new at their job and nobody's going to be seasoned in it because they're all moving from one organization to another. And I'm not sure what that does, um, but I do know this. They're still going to manufacture products. They're still going to sell things and they're still going to have a need to build them. Somebody's got to build the factories to build the stuff. Yeah, it feels like America has been trading on ancient strength. It's like yes. we've been we we've been we we've been in a cart that's been running on momentum for a little while in a lot of ways. Very good um, point. But ultimately, um, it's because, like I said, the floor is not that hard. The floor is soft and it's kind of okay. high, and yes. so it feels yeah. like yeah, if we need to, mm -hmm. like I still wouldn't want to start a war with America. But no. we're pretty we're we're not a, the fighting force we were fifteen years ago or yes. sixty years ago. That's right. Um, so yeah, yeah it, it's interesting, right? Yeah, Absolutely. I mean, yeah, yeah, and I think and I think that um, when you look at it that way, the it does there's there's two there's a couple of sides to it. You can look at it from the other point of view too. It creates a lot of opportunity, opportunity mm -hmm. to look for other things, opportunity to you know but, uh, you know but, find your real spot. In but place. only opportunity if the system is rewarding you taking advantage of opportunity, well, because you true. could you could paint a picture of somebody listening to this podcast right now who yeah. says, I'm going to get a job at a company like Steve's and I'm going to work there for 40 years and I'm going to yes. one day be an yes. executive vice president. But the reality is the system has responded to the market conditions. Absolutely. And so is that even possible? I'm not sure. It's a great question, because when I started, 
when I started in my working career, you know, I, we, I started um, getting into the industrial uh, realm and I always longed for that job, that job for that big organization that I'm going to be with for a long time and uh, build that career and grow with it and climb the ladder. Okay? Mm -hmm. Never happened um, till I recognized one day that, you know, um, I'm, I'm going to start a business, you know, and, and, and that's a whole nother story and a whole nother process. But that was, uh, that was when I realized I'm going to start a, a business. That was the last new job I ever had. And the only one I can never leave. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I keep adding them. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, a whole different, a whole different look that said, um, you know, we do, we do a lot of work in our organization, our small organization. Again, still small business. Our 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 business is small. We have we have you know almost fifty people in it. Um, every one of them is important to us, and we want the the company that they work for to be important to them. And I'd love them to be there for forty years. It'd be wonderful. Are they, how fast are they going to grow? You know, are we going to are we going to have the opportunity for them as a small business, mm -hmm. especially with every other business out there creating those opportunities, as you said, in, in our environment to to do something different and lily pad somewhere else. Very, very difficult. Doesn't change our goal yeah. is to build a, a, an organization where there's where, where they have an opportunity to grow and stay with it. But the reality is, Jason, if you're doing your job and you're and you're hiring the right people, you're looking for that honest, hardworking, self-motivated individual mm -hmm. that you found and now you want to invest in them. And you do that job so that you can invest in them so that they can pour back into the company and gain a return on that. Sooner or later, that good individual is going to find the ceiling. And, and really, if you're doing your job well, it'll be sooner than later. And there might not be another opportunity for them in this, in this organization. Now, we don't want to, you know, we don't want to limit that. We want to, you know, we want to, one, respect that and also celebrate that somebody can move on and do something better. Mm -hmm. We just have to build a model that we can actually do that. And, and it's sustainable. And we still benefit from that because we all want good people. And, um, I, you know, I think that's been, a, that's been an interesting thing for us to learn over the last couple of years, especially with the job market. I think every business has a, for the right individual or, or certain individuals has a, you know, it has a lifespan and that's all there's to it. Yeah. But even with these, so the thing about it is, is when you lily pad, what you're really doing is you're a hermit crab looking for a bigger shell because you can grow to the new size of the new shell. Right. That's right. And so, so often there's just shells lying all over the beach that are different jobs. It's so rare that a company provides new shells for that hermit crab on a regular right. basis. Yeah. And frankly, even, even if you extrapolate that upward before they hit that ceiling, there yeah. is a pressure and a responsibility on a, on a business owner. I've felt this, and I know you feel this. Yeah. Um, there's a pressure on you to expand the company just to give the shells yes. down to those hermit crabs, right? To I give mean, them opportunity for growth. Yeah, it's, it's so true. And, and it's, you know, it's one of the, it's one of the core um, uh, sayings in business. If you don't grow, you go. And that's a big part of it. You have to create opportunity for other people. Now, we're not the same company today that we were 20 years ago. We've grown along the way. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we've just not grown at the same pace as some of the individuals that have been in it. In many cases, we have some people that have some long tenure that we've grown at, at just the right pace for them and for that particular individual. And it's been, it's been wonderful. I think every company is going to have that um, to some degree, you know, with the exception of the military, the military, you can grow as far as you want. So. <laughs> you say that, but that's not true. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times there, there's there, I, I know I have a friend whose dad's a general. I, I knew a lot of people in, in the enlisted ranks and it's, um, 
It's just not, it's, it's not true. It's the same there. It's the same there. If you want to grow, you're going to need to go to this new post and this new job and this new thing. It's just within the army. Within, or within the organization. The, yeah, yeah. Within the organization. Yeah. When I think of something like, you know, uh, General Motors, uh, I think of my, my daughter works for the Marriott uh, group. And there's opportunity in, that, in those big organizations, not necessarily in the same department, if you will, but in the organization, there's opportunity for people to continue to grow and be part of yeah. it. Particularly when you're um, undeniable, right? If you can become undeniable in any yes. situation, typically yeah. you won't be denied, right? I think yes. a lot of times we think of jobs in terms of someone giving you opportunity, but the crea the reality is I don't care if you're a McDonald's line cook, you can create opportunity just by being undeniable. Yes, be undeniable is a very good way to put it. Uh, you know, everybody here, we try to coach them along and we just want them to understand that they have uh, an opportunity to create great value for the company. It doesn't matter what level they're at uh, to, to stay stagnant because, you know, it's going to leave you stagnant. And you can choose that or you can continue to grow and become more valuable. The more valuable you are, the greater your opportunities are. Mm. I think that's one of the other big responsibilities of a business owner is to you know, seek out those ways where you can create those opportunities for, for individuals. Maybe it's not the growth into another department, but maybe it's an opportunity within what they do. If, if, be, if being a problem solver is putting into play a series of systems and heuristics, mm -hmm. can you be a professional problem solver if you don't have yourself in order at home? Mm -hmm. Great question. Um, well, I think having yourself in order is an ongoing continuous job. Um, so the more you're in order, in my opinion, uh, to answer that question, the more you're in order, the, the much better you're going to be at helping somebody else solve their problems. No question about it. Um, and I think you can, you could probably being a problem solver, you can probably see who's struggling and who isn't. And, you know, everybody, we, you know, everybody has things going on. Everybody has things going on in their life. And we see that with our, with our own people, you know, there's, there's struggles going on and, and um, you either can help them through it um, uh, and try and coach them along, you know, uh, with whatever struggle they're having in their business life, you know, in the, in the job to get them through it um, or ignore that that happens. And I think ignoring that that happens is the wrong thing. It's just, mm. a, it's a fact of life. So. How do you personally stay in order? How do I personally stay in order? Yeah. You know, um, for me, I, uh, I, you know, I have some activities. I love, I love to, to um, recreation wise. I love, you know, I like golf. I, uh, you know, I spend time on vacation. I like to spend time with my family um, at my core. I have my faith that's important to me and, uh, and my family. Um, and I, and I work now, especially today more than, than uh, ever in my career is to, to put more time into that, um, more time into also, um, you know, I'm, I'm part of EO. I think I mentioned to you before the podcast, uh, entrepreneurs organization, getting involved in those, yeah, it's, it's a it's a great organization yeah, them. and great group of people and connecting with people that way. Uh, finding those opportunities, I think, to, um, you know, kind of kind of serve, give back, uh, always gleaning something from from it. You're always getting more than you really are giving. I think um, yes. when you get involved in some of those organizations and you're around the right kind of people. Um, very valuable. So. You know, for me to stay, I guess, uh, grounded, if you will, and um, and uh, uh, steady at the wheel in what we do here, those are the things I think that are important. You have to have those positive things in your life. And, um, you know, um, I, I've got a couple of groups that I'm involved in that we we uh, were able to, you know, a lot of business people involved and, and uh, were able to help each other through different struggles, whether they're personal or, or professional or even spiritual issues that, um, 
that arise in everyday life. And when you can, when you can be around people like that, that can, um, you're being served and you're serving at the same time. And I think that, I think that makes it healthy. Do you have, um, so it sounds to me like you have masterminding, which is fantastic. Yeah. Um, my friend Scott Ferguson always says there should be plus equals minus. In other words, you should have a mentor. You should be masterminding or collaborating with peers uh, and that you should have mentees. Is that something, do you have yeah. mentorship in your life? Do you mentor others? I do, both sides. Um, and, I, and I think it's a great way to put it too. And I've heard that before, but um, you know, I have a, a few um, individuals that, um, I consider mentors to me and can go to, um, with, with anything, um, and know me well so that I can, you know, get some good trusted advice, uh, from those individuals mm -hmm. having that, you know, that group, um, the peers is essential. I think, uh, much more comes out of that too, than, than people will realize it's, it's great to be around people that, uh, like to have fun together. But um, when you're doing life together and just, you know, while you're having fun, you're talking about life and struggles and, and um, opportunities and what's happening with your family, all those kinds of things. It's, it's, um, and they're the right people. I think that's, uh, I think that's essential. Uh, but also giving back, that, that part um, is great. So when, when you can have some uh, one on one time, and then you know you're in a, you're in a position where you're you know uh, my job here is to mentor right now and to to listen and pass along whatever I can. Uh, that's extremely valuable. It's fulfilling, but it also you can see somebody getting something out of it, and mm -hmm. I think that's fantastic. And I think we're all everybody's called to do that, uh, whatever capacity they have. I think everybody's called to do that in life. And it's interesting too, because when you take on a position of mentorship or even just teaching somebody something, you have to filter it through that pro that lens of like, I got to make sure this is right before I tell this person that. Absolutely. And so it makes yeah. you know it. I always say like, you know, knowing how to do something is like looking at this cup, right? I can see yeah. it from the angle that I see it from. But as soon as I start teaching it, I have to understand the cup from That's so right. many different angles yeah. and it just makes you, I mean, a freaking wizard. It gives you wisdom. Right. Um, and yes. so, yeah, I, I can appreciate that. Yeah. I, I think I, and I appreciate you saying it that way too, because um, it's easy to, it's easy to pass along blather. You kind of pass something along and make sure it's, if it's supposed to be wisdom, make sure it's wisdom. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. So when it's all said and done, Steve, what is the impact that you hope to leave on the world? Mm, wow, that's great. Yeah, you probably should have prepped me for that one. <laughs> <laughs> you should prep you for that one, Steve. Bullshit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> you know, um, I think that uh, uh, whenever that time is, um, because I'm, I feel like I'm only halfway right now. So there's a lot of opportunity in front of me. Um, I'd like to leave an impression that um, uh, we came, we, we, took, we took charge of uh, some opportunities that were put in front of us. We, we maximized myself, I guess, if I'm just talking about myself, I maximized my ability, uh, my, my God-given talent, if you will, whatever that might be and whatever level that might be. Um, I maximize that talent to uh, provide opportunity and give back to to this place, to this world, and um, and that um, people will walk away and have gained something from that, from whatever impact, whatever whatever task we decided was the right one for us, and we were called to do um, build this company, build the other company. You know, maybe maybe a maybe a future company down the road. Uh, be a part of a, an organization that uh, that uh, tries to help people in business. If if I'm pouring into that and and uh, maximizing my talent for that, and I did it to my fullest, and it can be recognized that way because of the evidence of people that are fulfilled by it, that would be that'd be a treasure. That'd be. Mm. That'd be fulfilled. 
That's beautiful, man. So there's two questions, Steve, that I ask everybody that comes on the show, and I'd like to ask you those two questions right now. Are you ready? Sure. All right. Uh, mm -hmm. The first question is, if you had access to unlimited financial capital, how would you profitably grow your current businesses? So for, for the industrial side, um, it would be, it would be a diverging into other markets. Um, so our, we're, we're, we have a good niche that uh, probably has its own ceiling. Uh, we'll stop growing for the kind of work that we do in that tier one, tier two supplier base. Mm -hmm. So growing into other markets, when I say other markets, maybe the OEM market, um, and then, and then um, possibly um, not necessarily um, not necessarily demographically, um, but uh, possibly in, in other industries. Um, for the manufacturing is scale. That would be it would be scaling it um, up and multiplying facilities. And that's probably more demographically. Too. That that business we didn't talk much about, but that business is uh, also somewhat unique and has its own niche. But um, that uh, that kind of we do we do tricky manufacturing, high precision type work for mm -hmm. aerospace and defense and 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 the like. And to um, scale that uh, would be would be something I'd probably go into. It would take some money and yeah. some capital. Yeah. Even as even as you're just talking there, so I've I've always been most of my life have been a service provider, uh, mm -hmm. and it sounds like your primary business is, yes. is a service provider. Yes. How does it feel to be able to buy a piece of equipment that can print money? <laughs> because I've always thought, does it feel yeah. that way to you? Because I feel like in manufacturing or in in that yeah. world, you go like, yeah. oh yeah, we bought this thing for a million dollars and it yeah. makes four hundred thousand dollars a year worth of profit or whatever. Mm -hmm. Does does that feel different to you going from service to sort of fulfillment and manufacturing? That, that's interesting. Um, so we, we, we started that business um, 10 years ago, 11 years ago in manufacturing specifically thinking that, you know, I've been building manufacturing facilities for 30 years. So yeah. Got to be something good to it. And I have, <laughs> uh, I have team people that have ex manufacturing experience. I've got some manufacturing experience as well, but most of my work is in the facility side and, you know, making the facility ready to manufacture. Somebody else figures out how to do the parts every day. I, and I, what an eye opener that was to get into that. Um, yeah, it, it sounds really, really good. You buy a machine that will print money. Yeah. Um, they have to want to buy the money. So, <laughs> and the machine typically only prints one type. Yeah. <laughs> Yep, that's true. So there's a there's. Oh there's my huge... God! You just opened up my eyes to how that can go if you buy yeah, the wrong machine and nobody wants to buy it. It sounds like huge opportunity. Yeah. Um, even the business I'm in with, when when I told you, you know, we, a lot of our work is in the plastics industry. Super, super capital intensive business. Um, there's a lot of flexibility in it, though. So the capital can last. You know that that return can extend you know, multiple platforms. So a platform could, you know, a project could be, you know, one platform on a vehicle that could last five to seven years. Well, that equipment and that infrastructure can still do another five to seven and another five to seven or some of the manufacturing machinery that you see out there where you think is you buy it and they just keep printing money. They don't want that money after five years. So that's not even, yeah. you don't even need that piece of equipment anymore. You got to find another way to do it. So here, long story short, yeah, jumping into manufacturing, having been in the industrial side, no truer words have, have uh, maintained themselves longer. It's, it's, it's all hard work. Yeah. It's all hard work. <laughs> yeah. And none of, quick, it's, none of it's easy. <laughs> I'll tell you a quick story. My, I spent, you know, an afternoon in banking as a young man. And the, one of the best bankers that I was around who I did not like and did not like me, probably because he recognized I was not one of them. Um, but 
he told me about his favorite business that they ever banked. And it was, uh, I think it was a Japanese company, uh, but it was this whole warehouse that spit out the seamless, um, we'll call them shaving cream cans without using the name of the company, the okay. seamless shaving cam cream cans. Yep. Uh, and there was one guy who would, you know, wheel a cart of blanks up. And there was one guy who would like make sure the electric was okay. If it broke, there was two people in the whole thing yeah. and the thing, yeah. they would literally just turn it on in the morning and just yeah. keep slowly feeding it stuff. And yeah. it just printed like hundreds oh, yeah. of millions of dollars yeah. a year oh, yeah. worth of these cans that, yeah. you know, I'm saying that case were, were profitable, but mm -hmm. uh, okay. So the second question, Steve mm -hmm. is if you had to give it all up, if you had to quit doing all of the businesses you've ever done professionally and start something totally new that mm -hmm. you've never done before, what do you think that might be? Never done before. Well, never done professionally. Okay. Um, I think I'd, I think I'd, pro I'd probably build, uh, I'd probably get into building uh, cars, custom cars, race, race. I used to build racing engines. Yeah. And I loved it. So one of my favorite projects. We so. should have been talking about cars this whole time. We missed an opportunity today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe another one. Yeah. yeah. And, um, Tell me more yeah, about that. So, yeah, so I mean, I, I just I just got involved, and in, I knew I was mechanical when I was a kid, and um, just loved all that that stuff. And I got into building cars, uh, building race engines, and um, I just loved it. I just thought this would be a, an amazing career to be able to do this. I don't know that there'd be any money in it today, um, but you said. You didn't say about making money. You no, know. you know, it's funny. I get, I get the answer I get from like the most, um, the most, the people that are the most living their dream tell me stuff that's the most throwaway. And so I would say like, yeah, yeah. making race cars. Uh, I yeah. had a guy tell me he would rent surfboards at a beach. I had another guy tell yeah. me he'd open like a coffee shop. Like, uh, and, uh, I think that's, um, I think that's indicative of a career path well chosen. Sure. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so that you know that that would be it. Um, maybe, um, maybe if I did something different, uh, uh, my second choice might be automation, more automation. Hmm. Uh, my 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 second favorite job was in a, a company that we had it was we had a lot of robotics and that, and just loved it. Loved yeah, super it. interesting. Yeah. Very interesting for me. Yeah. Well, Steve, you have an unbelievable and very interesting story. And more importantly, I think more than most people that I meet, you really understand what it's like to be an entrepreneur, the responsibility behind that, and the sort of the, the life that you're occupying. I think you have a really, really balanced and strong understanding of it. So thank you so much for coming on today to share your story and some of your wisdom. Um, is there anything that you'd like to share with the folks at home before we go or any way that you'd like to be contacted if anybody wants to speak to you more? Well, yeah. And, and uh, you can, um, you can contact me through our, our website. Uh, it's um, or just uh, yeah, our website is uh, ITS dash LLC.net. Um, and you can also, um, just, uh, I just want to appreciate the opportunity to do this, Jason. Yeah. Thank you very much. And, and if you want to tell anybody uh, in the audience just to, you know, enjoy the, the uh, holiday season, have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much, Steve, for coming. Thank you.